So uh, this morning we were building a smart house. So this afternoon we surely have a hacked house. <laughs> um, and in this uh, in this context, uh, we have Elmer, who's uh, a research engineer at SIDM, uh, who's going to talk to us about um, security and privacy in uh, in smart homes environment. Thank you very much for the introduction. Let's see if I can get some uh, slides on the screen for you. <clears throat> okay, so yes, I'm Elmer Lesnar and I work at SADN. Um, I put this very ambitious title on the slides. We're going to make the whole IT very secure. <laughs> it's not going to happen in that fast, of course, but that's our ultimate goal. You have to be a bit ambitious, of course. Um, First a bit on the IoT, it's everywhere. And but yeah, I don't have to tell you guys this obviously that's yeah, you're involved in it. Um, everything gets connected, whether you want it or not. Uh, try to buy a TV that is not a smart TV. Or maybe in a few years try to buy a fridge that is not a smart fridge and doesn't automatically connect to the local supermarket. It's yeah, it's challenging if you want to be offline, but yeah, many people like it. So uh, everything gets connected. It's like a bit like the new Bluetooth. Uh, everything now is Wi-Fi. But yeah, it just sells better. Um, but it also gives some problems. And yeah, you see in the news every now and then that uh, IoT devices get hacked. Everybody is very upset and like, surprised that it happens. And then, well, everybody forgets again and we all go on with our lives. Um, well, a, a few news items, a few, a few news websites, you say like it's a disaster in the making. Yes, it is already a disaster at some moments. It's just, yeah, many people don't notice it because People in their own house, they have an, a broken IoT device and they generally don't care if it sends a DDoS attack to somebody else or sends spam because yeah, they don't receive it. Um, IoT, there's many security holes in the IoT. Um, it, there's generally no updates. Or if there are updates, why would you update your, your fridge, for example? Or why would you update your smart plug? Um, there's no passwords or there's standard passwords that everybody knows, which is actually how me and I got uh, very big. They just, just lose a list of a few passwords. There's no encryption of data generally, or bad encryption if there is. Um, and they're leaking sensitive data, they're using cloud services all over the place. Probably the list goes on and on. You can name a thousand things that they do wrong. Many things have been solved in well, normal software development already, but this is the IoT, so everybody forgets all the lessons learned from normal software development. And they, yeah, they go to the, through the same cycle for whatever reason. Now the question, of course, is what should we do about it? Now, I drafted a nice list. So one of the things, for example, is better practices for uh, manufacturers yeah, to build secure software, uh, free and secure software stacks available that they can just use and then be sort of secure and hopefully also updated. Uh, maybe it's in policy or regulations or certifications even. Well, who knows? Something might happen in that area. Uh, maybe it should be through accountability. Yeah. If you say, well, if you ship a broken device, then you have to uh, pay a big fine. A bit of a GDPR for IoT kind of, a, kind of thing. Um, maybe you want to create a market demand for secure products. So you actually teach consumers to care about it. I don't think it will work, but you might, uh, you, you might want to try. You might want to quarantine bad actors. For example, at the ISP level, so some Dutch ISPs, for example, they already disconnect you off the internet if you participate in a DDoS, for example, just disconnect you, and then, then of course you call the help desk, and they say, well, you've got a virus on one of your computers, you might want to clean it up. And maybe it's through the users, and maybe we should educate users, maybe we should empower users to do something uh, themselves about it. Well, which one should we do? Generally, the answer to this is yes, we have to do all of it, everything. Um, and actually, maybe right can be something like that. Provide secure and free uh, operating systems for manufacturers. Um, anyway, all we, do we need to know all of this? Um, I'm going to highlight the solution that we are trying now with the with SPIN project. Um, first of all, well, a little thing how the typical home network might look. You've got above the evil internet uh, in red. And below in green, the half, the half on the down, is the, your, your, your home, your typical home. 
Now you're connected with a modem or a router that you get from your ISP. When I say you, well, probably here, there's other scenarios as well, but this is like the, the typical one. Then there are some devices in there, IoT devices in this case. So you might have a car that well, updates, you might have a fridge, you might have a TV or a light bulb. And they are all connected through the router and then to the internet. And basically what we're considering is can we put some firewall, can we put something in between those two? Now you often see, especially also for home networks, that there is already a firewall protecting on the home network against the evil internet. But we actually want to turn it around. We want to protect the internet against the evil home network. So we assume that the home network is IoT devices compromised and well, very bad stuff. So how can we protect the internet against all those IoT devices that are infected? Um, now, before I continue, um, maybe a tiny bit about SIDN, like why are we working with IoT? Um, because SIDN is a non-for-profit foundation that is basically the registry for .nl. So we maintain the list of all .nl domain names. Now we, well, we publish it, we provide DNS services for that. Um, many people do not know us because, well, you register a domain with a company and yeah, you don't care where actually that company registers it itself. Um, but in the end, for all the .nl, it arrives for us. Um, well, and it already says it here, we manage a fault-tolerant and distributed infrastructure in the sense that we provide DNS for all the .nl domain names. Um, within SIDN, we also have a labs team, the research team, and here's the evidence that I'm also in it. Um, and generally we do research on, uh, well, securing the internet. Of course, our primary focus is .nl. So if we can do something about phishing or fake web shops, we first do it with .nl. And then we hope that the, the criminals go to other TLDs. <laughs> and we can say that we're very safe. But we also publish a lot and we, well, we hope to contribute to the open source software and things like that to well, make everything, the whole internet a safer place. Um, well, we saw this news article a couple of years ago. Uh, it was the Mirai attack, a big botnet consisting of IoT devices, and um, well, it cost a 1.2 terabit at the DDoS attack, basically. So they took down Brian Krebs and his weblog. I don't know if you know it, but he's uh, always blogging about criminals, and now they always take down him first when something happens. Um, and they also attacked the DNS provider Dyn. And um, Dyn also went offline for, well, two days or so. And that caused problems with those services listed here, which is, for many people, most of their digital online life is this. <laughs> so many people know this, the DDoS attack, even though those services themselves were not attacked, it was the DNS that got attacked. <coughs> so they had no Twitter, no Netflix, well, yeah, what do you do? Then you have nothing to do anymore. Um, however, as, as IDN, we were also looking at this, well, like, ah, a DNS provider taking down, lots of problems. We are also a DNS provider, maybe not in the same way, but if we are taken down by a, by a botnet, then whole.ml would be unavailable. And I'm like, oof, <laughs> that will definitely hit the news and then everybody will know us, look, that's not good. So um, we started thinking like, okay, what can we do? Well, there's lots of technical means you can do, like DNS Anycast and things like that to limit the, the scope of the DDoS attack. Um, but we were like, well, maybe we can do something also at the core. At, eh, what caused this DDoS attack are unsecure home networks. <clears throat> so we started the SPIN project, the security and privacy for in-home networks. Um, and that's it's a very fancy device, but it's actually a software project. Um, it's open source, so it's on GitHub available. We try to, well, in the end, eh, our goal is to make an open platform uh, based on open standards to secure your, uh, well, your home network. Ideally, we want it to, well, to, we want the ISPs to actually put our software on every router and to prevent eh, IoT devices from performing DDoS attacks onto the world. Um, we have two goals, roughly. One is give the users insight in what happens in the network. Okay? You, want to know, you want the users to be able, if they, they don't probably don't care, but if they want to care about it, they have to see like what kind of devices are there on my network. And the second goal is to well, block bad stuff for whatever definition of bad stuff. Um, so we have some software that we made. Um, we are running it now on this little GLINet device. 
uh, which has hardly any available power, but we figured that if it runs on this, then it will also run on the routers or ISP, <coughs> the and the modems. So uh, if you go down and you can always scale up. Um, we have some software that well actually provides it's a CCTV. You can uh, you, you see your the devices on your network. Uh, you can maybe have a camera here, you can maybe have a what is it, a Philips U. Um, you see exactly with which services they communicate, because we, we are the DNS server of the home network, so we register the DNS request, we look at all the traffic flows, and we all, well, it all stays within this little device, and we just display it to the user. Um, and if something bad happens, so for this case, we have a Philips U and a camera to be blocked, then it all becomes very red, and you can you see what, what happens. Um, this is, of course, a prototype. I mean, this, is, this interface will never make it. But we already tried this with a few users. Um, and they were like, oh, wow, my Samsung TV connects to Facebook or to CloudFront. Why? <laughs> or we have actually one Samsung TV that we connected ourselves. And we I had just bought it, we connected it. And within the first five minutes, it connected to Facebook. But we haven't touched anything yet. Those are things that you might wonder, like, why would my TV connect to Facebook? And I did, we didn't request anything yet. Um, and of course, you can block that also. But at least it's, it's first to like, inform the users of what is going on in the network. Um, well, basically, and I showed a little device before. If you have the router of your ISP, we, in our current scenario, we put it next to it. And we connect all the, the IoT devices through Wi-Fi to our little device. And we do that because we don't care about computers. Computers, yeah, they have virus protection, they have viruses anyway, so many things can happen. The network behavior of a computer is very unpredictable. And yeah, for us that makes it very hard to do anything with it. Um, on the contrary, IoT devices generally are very predictable. They have very predictable network traffic, they search maybe at 3 o'clock in the night for an update, and they, well, if you click I want to turn on this smart belt. You turn it on, that gives one network signal, followed by the yes, I got turned on, and then the lines are built uh, as it goes on. It's very predictable network traffic. <coughs> Currently, we focus only on IoT devices. Um, yeah, this is a bit of the architecture, but it's very detailed. The takeaway message here is there's just several components in our system. So we try to uh, make sure that yeah, every component can be independently used. Um, this is a sort of a different loop of it. It looks really much nicer. So we have the, the router on the left with basically two functions. We want to register traffic. So we want to well, get the PCAP files generally. We want to see what happens <coughs> on the line. And we want to block traffic. We want to be able to stop anything bad happening. Uh, there's a little uh, well, MQTT message broker, and then there's like different modules here with whatever functionality uh, that you have. Um, if there is network traffic, it gets captured, sent to the MQTT server, which then uses public subscribe to public subscribe to send it to all the other modules, who can then visualize it or get statistics out of it or do anything else. For example, if you have a policy enforcer and it sees that your smart TV is connecting to Facebook or trying to connect to Facebook, then the policy enforcer might say, well, that's not something we want. So it sends a command back like, no, don't do that. And then the TV either gets blocked in its entirety or only the connection to Facebook gets blocked. Um, there is another thing. Um, what kind of, because this is a policy enforcer, you might wonder, what kind of policies can we enforce here? Now, one of those things is the manufacturer uses description. And maybe by a show of hands, how many people know it already? Only a few, so that's good. Um, this is a, a IET, IETF draft uh, for a kind of a policy-based system that an IoT device will then, when it connects to a network, it will broadcast a URL saying, I have a, a network policy that you can download on this URL. Then the gateway, or in our case, our little box, can download the network policy from that URL, generally from the manufacturer's website, and it enforce it to the IoT device. And policy still sounds a bit abstract, maybe. It's just a list of, I can connect to these host names, I can connect to these domains. This is what I'm allowed to do on the network. Um, if the IoT device then gets hacked or whatever else happens, you can just say, well, oh, this is not in your policy. 
you're bad. So either block, you can do it on the, on the basic IP, on IP tables level, block anything except that, or you can say, well, if you violate it, we just take you offline because uh, it's not good what you're doing. Um, now, there's one thing, of course, this is also for, this is both for incoming and for outgoing. So both the incoming traffic gets limited, but also the outgoing one, and that's what we as SIDM want, and we, we don't want any EDOS attacks on us, so the outgoing traffic is also gets filtered. Um, there's one problem with this, because most of the IoT devices that are notoriously broken are ones from cheap Chinese manufacturers. And it's unlikely that they will, well, even though it's very fancy nice standard, it's unlikely that they will implement this, because it's, well, it costs time to do it. Unless it's, of course, it's forced. But um, it's unlikely that this will happen. So, um, well, we were looking at it like, okay, suppose that we well, suppose that the IT devices, even though the MUD standard exists, suppose they still don't use it, what should we do then? So we have, well, kind of two ways in which we're looking now. One of them is, well, anomaly detection. We just register which, what kind of traffic an IoT, IoT device has, monitor it over a couple of days, and then, well, we kind of make our own profile of it. Um, the alternative to that is that we generate our own MUD profile for the IoT device. We also have some running code for that already. So you might, well, for a couple of days, for a couple of weeks, whatever time frame, you monitor all the traffic from the IoT device, and then you generate your own web profile that you then apply to your device. This has one disadvantage, and is that if you generate such a profile, you have to be sure that all the traffic is in there. So if you have a light bulb, but you never switch it on during your measurement period, you have a nice MUD profile, but you cannot turn it on anymore after that because yeah, you didn't do it during the measurement interval. Um, and a manufacturer, of course, they know exactly what happens, or they should know exactly what happens in a device, so they can actually make a better one. But well, at least we can solve it, sort of. Um, that's what we have now. We're currently looking at extensions to the MUD, to the whole spin uh, uh, system. One of the thing, things is that we're interested in is profiles in general, device profiles. So if you connect your new nice smart TV, you um, well, you might get a pop-up on your phone saying, hey, a new TV got connected. What kind of profile do you want to apply to it? It doesn't have its own web profile, so maybe you want to do the generic TV profile yeah, that allows some streaming services, for example. Or maybe you want it to not connect at all to the internet or whatever the user decides. Uh, so that would be pretty cool. Um, another thing is, uh, suppose that they are already infected. Right? So I just, I said before, some ISPs, they block your whole network. So you, they, they disconnect your whole house when they find some bad traffic in your, uh, in your network traffic. Um, what if the ISP could well, send a signal to the router saying, well, we found some, some DDoS attack originating in your network. Uh, it happened at this date. And the target was this IP address. Um, can you please locate who did it? And then your router might say, oh, I've got a nice traffic history. This specific IoT device, yeah, that was the one that did it, or this computer even did it. So let's take that one offline. Then it's not your whole network that gets disconnected. It's just the specific IoT device that was, well, was to blame, or the specific device in general that was to blame. Um, and, well, I would imagine that blocking whole household holds by it entirely actually will not go on for very long because suppose you have medical IoT devices yeah, that constantly have to connect to a doctor, for example, over the, over the internet. It would suck a bit if well, you, you can write the, the first news article already. Yeah, IoT device got blocked by ISP, whole network offline, patient dies because yeah, press the emergency button, but yeah, the doctor didn't get alerted. So you might already imagine something like that. So that's uh, well, we are hoping to actually make it more granular, the granular, sorry, uh, the, the, the blocking itself. Um, and then the future of the of security and privacy for the IoT. Um, well, yeah, that's maybe something up for discussion. So I guess we have some time for questions also. Um, should it be fully automated, or should the user be involved, or should the ISP be involved, or should it be only the manufacturers involved with it? We can. Uh, you can see how who should be involved in it, or um, should there be legal things? And should there be laws against it? Should there be certification? Well, nobody knows exactly what will happen, but no. 
it's some discussion that in the end we need to have, uh, I think. Um, well, if there's any other questions, then uh, I would be open uh, to answer any. Thank you very much for your uh, for your attention. Thanks for this uh, really nice talk. Um, some questions? I already see some uh, some hands here. All the way to back. I've just tried without that. Yeah. Okay, uh, it's Marco reference sheet. Uh, when you say like, oh, we look at trend analysis and, and anomaly detection, uh, how much data do you intend to keep on the device? What's the cost? <laughs> and, uh, well, yeah, the metric acronym these days is GDPR. Yeah, well, the thing is, we don't we store everything locally, um, so there's not no cloud service or anything like that uh, included. <clears throat> so that already should be better, I guess, against the GDPR. Um, we, uh, I, I don't know exactly also how we should store it yet, so it's, it's, a, it's prototyping, so we just try something out and then we make it compliant after that, that's the easy answer. Um, but I think um, we, we can store quite a lot of history data, just aggregated or maybe even hashed, and we don't need to know what IP it is, we just need to be able to match an abuse uh, alert to whatever uh, we know that happened in the past. We don't need to make a translation back to say, this device connected to this IP, or this port at this time, that, that we need, don't need to know. We just need to be able to make a match retrospectively. So I think it, it shouldn't be too bad, I hope. Um, you mentioned the net mod that some of the routers do not implement. It. Uh, do you have some concrete numbers? The, the, well, you mentioned about the Chinese manufacturers. Yes. Devices that only implement net mod. I don't have really concrete numbers. We, we bought like, I don't know, we had, we had a, a course at the university that we gave. And we had asked all the students to use their own IoT devices, and we also bought quite a few ourselves to make a little test lab. And um, it was terrible, <laughs> really. Even the ones that we bought here in the Netherlands, you know, for quite a lot of money, for 50 euros or so, for, for a smart light bulb. And uh, one of my students hacked it within a day. And then really couldn't do anything on it. So, yeah, I, I don't have, I can't say like it's 50% or something like that, but. Um, I would say that more than a quarter has really severe problems of what we, the small sample that we tested then. And you might want to know that there is in the idea there is something called port control protocol uh, that allows to configure NATs and firewalls on the routers. Uh, but the chances <coughs> are that they are not, it's not implemented on every, on every Netgear router at home. But you might want to have a look. Okay, yeah, thanks. Thanks. <coughs> So uh, it's really really interesting presentation. It's really attracting. But just the just the thing you talk about, you uh, your students used to uh, uh, maybe uh, try uh, made in China browsers. Yeah. You, you even bought it here in the Netherlands. You still find it so hard. When how can this vulnerable router can be existing in the Netherlands? Is there any? organization or lab that has already evaluated and which allows it to exist in this market? Well, as far as I know, there's no certification or anything like that. There's the CE. Yet. Okay, Mark, should we... The should social we, certification, so... So, uh, to what kind of uh, direction you will uh, think about how does this fix in the future? Uh, uh, how should the products which might be vulnerable to be certified or evaluated? In advance. Yeah, so then uh, let me go back to this slide. This is kind of the answer. We need to do all of this. <laughs> so, yes, there needs to be certification. Yeah. And whatever level there needs to be, uh, well, ISPs need to do something, there needs to be software stacks, just, and even more than all, mm -hmm. than all of this. Mm -hmm. Everything like that needs to happen in order to well, make it a bit more secure. But especially the manufacturers need to care. In whatever way we can make them care, but they have to care about security in the end. Yes. So this is how we all should contri contribute to. Uh, mean for all of us to like contribute to 
uh, how to define the specification or how to evaluate the IoT devices in the future, right? It's not only about which country uh, the products made by which country. It's for all of the devices, right? It's all of them. There are also very bad ones from Korea. I need that's, uh, but it's uh, my students. They always say I buy it on AliExpress, and then they just select one with the lowest price, and that happens to be from China. Then, but it, indeed, I don't think it is. It's Chinese, China specific. It's IoT specific, or IoT in general, even. Yes. So it's so, most, yeah, but IoT, they tend to forget everything they ever learned. Yeah, from this slide, we still have a lot of things to do for the, to contribute to. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you. But, uh, last, last question. Not a question, but a comment on your monitoring device. I think that's something that educating user and the following user is really important. And when designing, oh, all your devices are currently there and there, and you did something really important, is as IT uh, managing networks, we, we know we don't look into users' data. We don't check web, which websites are checking or anything. And only including uh, IoT devices, you are really removing the, oh, if it was monitoring the kid computer, which website would be looking at and everything. And so it's educating user on what they should look at and what they are allowed to look at because they may not be allowed to look at every what people on their network are doing. So the meeting on your IoT devices is really good thing. So thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, oh. It's very short one there. Very nice. So you made some parallel with the uh, data protection regulation. Yeah, as far as I understand, it says that uh, like you should only collect what is necessary for operating, say, the website. So, would it make sense to uh, like do some parallel in the AOT to say, okay, your device should work anyways if it it cannot access, so it says a fridge. You don't need the internet to make the thing cool. It's like to force the manufacturers to make them work despite not being connected. That would be cool, but then. They might still connect to their own cloud service and through there. No, but so, so you just don't connect it, just block Yeah, that could also be, yeah. But then you don't have all the features that, uh, that people will care about. <laughs> you might not, but many people, they, they look at the lowest price and the most features and then they try to balance. <laughs> all right, thanks.